Hey, kids, Grandpa here. So, uh, doing a little boat shopping, looking at some options available to me. You can, <laughs> you can see the mess here in the garage that I'm dealing with. It's all good. It's perfect for the time being. It sure as hell beats my cold little cabin up in Alaska, that's for sure. <clears throat> but uh, I was doing some boat searching, and I thought I'd be interested to take you guys along for a ride and kind of show you what I look at when I'm looking at boats. Now, give you guys a brief update, because this is going to be a fairly long video to begin with. Um, I am reorganizing, uh, adjusting my plan here in Ohio. I'm in the process of getting my license back together again for Florida. Start selling real estate down there. I will be back and forth between Ohio and Florida, spending most of my time in Ohio. But I will be spending time in Florida, obviously, and uh, temporarily I'm going to motel it, but I will be buying a boat to live on in Florida. So I'm kind of looking at different boat options. Now, for right now, I'm probably going to end up buying a 36 to 40 foot monohull. Uh, but I still was doing a search today looking at some catamarans, looking at some options for some boats down the road, looking, you know, trying to keep myself up to date with what's available. And I came across a pretty interesting boat. One I was not familiar with, uh, but that I apparently have some ties to somehow, I, which I was not aware of. Uh, and so I want to kind of show that to you. So let's uh, let's go ahead and jump right into that and uh, see what we find, okay? So this is what I was looking for. I, I was just on Yacht World. I'm looking at catamarans. I was looking for something in the 42-plus foot length or 40-foot length, um, something new, though. I wanted something fairly new. This is a 2014 Alpha 42, goes by the name of Lucy 2. Now, I'd never heard of this uh, company before. <clears throat> I had never heard of Alpha Boats before. And so I was kind of surprised to see a catamaran made by this company that I'd never heard of. Turns out they're a very small, very small uh, catamaran manufacturer in Patchhawk, New York. Not too far from where I used to live, and certainly an area that I know very, very well. Um, I grew up on Long Island in New York as a kid. So I was sort of excited and interested to find out that there's somebody manufacturing catamarans on Long Island. Now, what's odd about that is that Long Island is a very expensive neighborhood to live. Um, so labor costs must be through the roof trying to make boats there. And this has been the problem with most of the boat manufacturers and why they don't locate in places like Long Island. Long Island is an island. It's finite. It's only, you know, just so big. And so uh, it's the laws of supply and demand. As more and more people want to live there and you can't expand it, prices go up. And I used to live in New York. I, I used to on Long Island. I used to own a house on Long Island. And I can tell you housing is extremely expensive on Long Island. And an area that, uh, well, frankly, I would never want to live in again. Way too many people and way too small of an area. So I was kind of surprised to see a catamaran manufacturer being able to be competitive uh, in producing a good quality boat uh, underneath those circumstances. Because Long Island just is not a conducive neighborhood uh, for that. And of course, if you're a boat builder and you live there on Long Island and you already have a boat yard, that's fine. But the labor cost and, and building boats is a lot of layer, laying up all the fiberglass and the carpentry work and the wiring and all that stuff. It's a lot of labor that goes into building a catamaran, 42-foot boat, a lot of labor. And so the labor cost must have been astronomical, and, and so therefore the profit must have been pretty low. Uh, but let's take a look at the boat, and we'll see how things go from there, okay? So first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the boat. As generally speaking... Uh, a fairly attractive catamaran, sort of the new modern design with, uh, you know, the wave, wave piercing holes, they call this very high bridge deck, uh, which allows for waves to break up underneath the hull without slapping the bottom. So that's a great design feature. Uh, looks like we've got some trampolines out front. So breaking waves will flush right on through. Uh, looks like some nice straight up sideboards, good windows. Uh, it's got some good lifelines up the sides, uh, seating up in the bows, which I like. A good an anchoring system uh, would be easy to set up there. Uh, roller furling main, or, or foresail, so that's nice. Uh, the windows are fairly straight up and down. Now, that's sort of an important thing on catamarans. 
you really like having a, a sort of a straight up window profile, like the lagoons have a very straight up. For a long time, they, they try to make it more aerodynamic and like this. And what happens is in the tropics, the sun breaks down through those windows, comes through the glass into the uh, cockpit and really cranks up the heat inside the cockpit. So they found by, by making straight up windows and then having a roof that has even a bit of an overhang to shade that window keeps the inside of the boat a lot cooler in the tropics. Um, one of the reasons why the lagoon design is so popular right now. This has a little bit of a rake to it, but not too bad, so it would be fairly minimal, but it would still be getting some sunlight inside there, and that's something you want to consider when looking at catamarans. Uh, some of the cat designers, what they did, even though their boat has a, a, lot, of, a lot of rake to it, they, they put these like little shaded, almost steps, fiberglass steps over the windows. So you could still see out, but you were, you were looking through steps that were on the fiberglass to, to help shade the window. Sort of a you know, remedial step, but didn't really do the job. So anyhow, uh, looks like he's got the uh, helm uh, off here to port. And uh, well, that's what we can see in that picture. Let's go on to the next one. Okay, so here we're looking at it from, from the bow on. Again, nice high bridge deck. It's got a center divider to help break things up, so that, that's very good structurally there. Very strong hole-to-hole uh, -hole fit, so that looks structurally like it's very sound. The uh, holes themselves look yeah, fairly narrow, not real broad, but hopefully suitable. That tells me there's probably not a lot of storage in the holes, but some room down there. Uh, other than that, it looks pretty much straightforward from here. Now here we're sitting in the cockpit looking forward. You can looks like you've got some good visibility here. Uh, I, I, I question the value of that little windshield, but you know I guess if the wind's just right, you can duck behind that a little bit, or at least it'll move the air up over the top of you. Um, and in this picture, it seems like there's two foresails, two head sails out. So that's an interesting configuration. Obviously, we have Furuno gauges. Looks like the lines are led aft here. Looking at the finish of this, I like the little trim strip there. That looks pretty nice. Don't like seeing the exposed screws there. The fiberglass work, however, looks very clean, very shiny, very nice. Not really sure what this is here. Maybe some sort of a panel or something that covers something up. And this obviously is a cover for an electric switch that would be used to uh, control the head furl or what have you. Okay, very clean engine room. I really like the clean engine room. Plenty of room to get in here and work. There's your tankage over there. Uh, this looks like it's all nice and accessible. So obviously what we're dealing with here is you've got a Yanmar engine and you've got a sail drive sticking down through the hull. Very typical catamaran design. I like the sound deadening. Tankage on both sides. Probably could use some more sound deadening to help with that, but looks like a very nice design. So here we have a, a general overall picture. You know, twin engines, um, four cabins. Uh, what it's not really showing here, I guess this is the head. So toilet and shower area and sink on the inside of the hull for the head. Um Pretty, pretty straightforward and typical, I, I, I guess. Not showing any kind of galley or anything shown here. This is just the lower level down inside the hulls. All right, so here we are, obviously, in uh, uh, what would be the starboard hull. You can see we're looking forward. There's a room. Kind of interesting little uh, door, like a little hobbit door. So to get in and out of this bed, you've got to get into this room, this area here, past this door. You can see this door here on the side, the, the hinges here and here. You have to get into this area and then get on a knee and then crawl up into that area. So as I suspected, the holes are not really wide. I also am concerned, you know, big guy like me, can I fit in this area here and swing that door open and close? I'd have to be tight over in this corner for that door to swing. If that door swung the other direction, that might have been a better idea. Kind of hard to swing that door through there and stand in that space at the same time. Just an observation. 
Head looks like there's plenty of room around it. I like the raised sinks and the, the Corian countertops. Got some power available there. I'm, I'm a little concerned about spilling water directly in the power, so that would be an issue. Obviously, the shower is over here out of sight, but looks like a pretty good design. Okay, here we are uh, in the uh, port hull looking back towards the stern, apparently. And uh, again, there's a little window, looks like a little window kind of thing getting up into the bed from here. A little shelf. This must be the head here. Interesting. All right, the galley. A lot of nice features to the galley. It looks like two bowl, very deep two bowl sinks. Side by side, five and a half cubic foot refrigerator freezers. Very nice design in that regard. Looks like plenty of stores, nice cabinetry. Looks like a toaster oven on countertop. So I don't know if there's an oven built in. I'm not sure what that is access to. Little shelf here, good visibility. Looks like a one burner or maybe a two burner cooktop is all there is, is a two burner cooktop. Yep, side by side refrigerators and freezers. There's your nav station. I don't see any seating in the nav station, but I'm sure you got a little tussock or something you can put out there. I don't like the idea of having seating wrapping around the the uh, mast here. That just seems like it's really in the way and uncomfortable. But windows that open, which is nice. Looks like a nice seating area, very typical raised lips, so stuff doesn't fly it off the top. Looks like plenty of room and comfortable. Again, the beds, you got to crawl through these little openings to get into them, and, you know, there's, there's no way you're falling out of that bed, so that looks pretty good. Head looks pretty good. I think this is the shower. I think we're looking up, actually. Or sideways. This window may be opening up into the uh, into the uh, clearance underneath the bridge deck as an escape hatch. But the staterooms look pretty good. Looks comfortable. Looks like there's plenty of room around there. Here's another picture of the of the galley. A little cabinetry here. Some knife storage. I guess it just has this little two burner. And it looks like the only oven I see is this countertop thing that was over there. I'm not seeing anything else in the way of a. Uh, of a uh, cook, uh, an oven, which I guess is pretty typical on a lot of these boats. Up, oh, up, oh, I'm going to go back. I missed that. Three burner, one, two, three burner cooktop. Ha. Huh. Another shot of the nav station. There's your AC, DC electrical panels. Now, this really looked very nice. Uh, I was really pleased with the layout. Everything is in one spot. You've got good gauge systems on there for. For monitoring tankage and that sort of stuff. Um, all your main cutoffs for your AC and DC power. Uh, look like a fairly well designed laid out uh, instrument or, or power panels here. I'm not 100% sure what is being controlled here. I would say this is your, your solar charger. And uh, with my bad eyesight, I can't read what that is. But... Uh, this obviously is a uh, solar panel charger, your battery maintenance uh, charger. I'm not 100% sure what that is. And of course, there's no caption on the video to tell you what that is. So. All right, another view at one of the other heads or one of the other staterooms. Pretty typical. Another view of the shower, I guess. Another view of the head. All right, here we have the rear cockpit. Good seating area. Okay, one thing I'm going to point out I really do like. I like this area here along the back of the boat where you can walk back and forth from one deck to the other. As a scuba diver, as a fisherman, I really like this accessibility here along the back of the boat. If you're fighting a fish or if you need to get your gear set up for scuba diving, this becomes a critical area. I do think it's interesting that the, the mainsail traveler is located all the way down here. So these lines are always kind of running around this uh, um, roofed area. 
but apparently that uh, lays out well for them that way. But I do like this walking area here along the back. Looks like plenty of room here, a couple steps up to get into the uh, um, the controls. Um, so far, I'm kind of liking this boat. I'm kind of liking this boat. Yep, I like the walkway through there, easy access, good couple steps up into the helm station, good view from up in the helm. He's got his own little bimini up there, so that gives him some protection from the, sh from the sun. Uh, it's like a sliding door goes into this pocket, plenty of visibility. Kind of liking this little boat, 410,000 for a 42-foot catamaran. Nice steps going up the back. Could use some railing. I would like to see this lifeline continue down this so as to provide some railings for uh, getting up and down the steps. Us older guys tend to appreciate that a bit more. Now, here is an interesting photo of this. You can really see the rake of the mast and how severely raked that mast is pulled towards the stern. You can also see the davits shown on the back of the boat as well. Kind of a sleek looking boat. It just kind of looks fast, doesn't it? All right, so that was the photos of the boat. So now is what I do when I typically look at boats. I go down here, I read the description. Okay, Lucy 2, builder, Alpha Yachts, Inc. Never heard of Alpha Yachts. Gregor Tarzan is a designer. And it's a catamaran. Okay, well, let's go down and take a look at the specs. 41 foot, 8 inches. Length overall, LOA, length overall. The beam or the width of the boat, 24 foot, 3 inches. LWL, length at waterline, 41 feet, 8 inches. So that would be different than the length overall, especially in monohulls. You'll see a big difference in that. Not so much in cats here. Obviously, they're identical uh, because of the way the, uh, the uh, front of the, the bows rake backwards on this boat. Typically on a monohull, the bow would rake forward, so the deck would be longer than the waterline. But still, maximum draft, 3 foot 7 inches. Nice. I like the shallow draft that allows this boat to get into a lot of shallow places that you can't get with a, with a big 6-foot uh, deep um, monohull. Headroom at being right at 6 foot. Okay, for me, I am 6 foot 3, so that is a big negative. I'm not walking around this boat with my head bent over all the time. So that was a, a negative for me that would kind of rule this boat out for me. But there's other reasons why I ruled this boat out, and I'll get into those in a minute. Total power, 80 horsepower. That's typical. 40 aside. 2014 Yanmar JH, JH5Es, which is typical diesel. 1,290 engine hours. Three bay prop. Sail drive, 40 horsepower. Okay. Engine hours. Let's talk about that real briefly. When I look at engine hours, the first thing I do is I grab my calculator and I say to myself, okay, if this was in my diesel truck and I drove 1,290 hours, I'm probably averaging somewhere around 50 miles to the gallon or 50 miles an hour rather. So I take 1,290 and I multiply that by 50. And that tells me that this, these engines have the equivalent of about 65,000 miles on them. Now, that's sort of arbitrary, and it's just something that I do. I don't know really how accurate that kind of figure is. But, you know, being someone much more experienced with driving a vehicle as opposed to a boat, it seemed like a sort of a logical way of approaching that and put it in a perspective that is, you know, simpler for for us old country boys to understand. So I think this boat has about 65,000 miles on those engines if you want to think of it as being a diesel engine in a truck, like my, my excursion. Um, and I just picked 50 miles as an arbitrary figure. You can choose to use whatever figure you want, but I, that, I'm trying to give that some perspective. So 65,000 miles on a diesel is nothing. That's, that's, you know, that's a quarter of its life, maybe. Uh, I tend to get very high mileage out of diesels. Uh, I've got 167,000 miles on the one that I have now. Uh, my last one, I had almost 450,000 miles on. So uh, they, diesels can last a long time. And what it is about diesels is they turn at a slow RPM. 
Um, generally speaking, a diesel turns at a very slow RPM as opposed to a gas engine. Uh, gas engines tend to run at three, four, five, six thousand RPM. You know, the diesels run in that 900 to 2000 RPM range. Uh, so every time, every time it goes around, that creates wear. Obviously, if it's traveling at half the RPM, it's traveling half as much, uh, fewer times going around. I'm talking about the engine as everything turns in the engine. So they just tend to last longer mileage wise because they don't turn as often. Uh, they deal with things with high compression and stuff. So anyhow, let's go back to the uh, boat description and see where we're at. So 1,290 miles, I consider that to be fairly low miles for a diesel engine. And that would not be a concern for me at all. What I do find interesting here and something I'm going to point out is the hours are the same on both engines. This is not common on a catamaran to see them. What you'll find usually is one engine will have a lot more hours than the other engine. And the reason being is quite often one engine is used more for other ancillary things, charging battery banks, heating hot water, running the generator. Um, so quite often you'll see one engine with a lot more hours than, any other, uh, than the other engine, and, and that could very well be why. So I find it interesting that both engines on this boat have the same hours on them. Um, so that's actually a, a good thing from my perspective. Okay. Cruising speed, seven knots at 2,500 RPM. That's about typical. I do like the tankage, 140 gallons of water, 100 gallons of fuel. This is cruising category, okay? You need to get up over 100 gallons of water and 100 gallons of fuel. You need to be up in this size tankage. If you're going to have a real cruising boat as opposed to just a, a coastal cruiser or a, uh, you know, a day sailor or what have you. Um, the tankage size is a really good indication as to what the designers thought the application of that boat was going to be. So when you see, you know, good size tankage, like 140 gallons of water, 100 gallons of fuel, these guys actually expected this boat to cross oceans. All right, so we have four double berths and a single berth. Okay, well, we didn't talk about the single berth. This particular boat has a um, captain's quarters up in the forepeak. Uh, uh, in the very front of the bows, there's a hatch that opens up on the deck. You can crawl down there, and there's a bed up in the forepeak or, or in the crash bulkhead, as it were. Um, more often than not, a lot of the catamarans will do that, especially the charter boats, because if you have crew on board, the crew can sleep up in those four peaks, giving the main cabins, the, in this case, four other cabins, uh, could be available for guests or charter customers. And uh, so the people that actually work the crew, the captain and the, and the first mate, they sleep up in those four peaks. They're very small. They're very cramped. They're very hot. They're not a good place to live, uh, but they do exist. So... <clears throat> okay, electronics, we have a compass, cockpit speakers, plotter, autopilot. It doesn't say anything about what kind. I'd be interested to know more of the details of that. What brand, what model and stuff. Radar, radio, depth sounder, log speedometer. Okay, all the basic stuff is there, all the normal stuff. But we have no indication really other than the photos that we saw of what kind of brand or quality they are. And, and from the photos, we were able to determine that they were, that they were pretty nice stuff, that they were all right. So... CD player, nav center, wind speed direction, repeaters, VHF, GA. Okay, what does a repeater mean? A repeater means that you have one set of, of uh, instruments at the nav station, and you have a second set of instruments up at the cockpit where you're driving the boat from the helm. So a repeater just means that you'll have dual instruments. We have a fully battened mainsail. We have a furling Genoa. Okay. Now, I thought when I looked at this boat, there was two head sails, and I'm only seeing a furling Genoa listed here. So that brings up a question. Okay. We have electric winch. We have a steering wheel. Well, it would be kind of hard to steer the boat without a steering wheel, but it means we have steering wheel and not a tiller. We have hot water, electric bilges, a toaster oven. So apparently that's all there is, is a toaster oven. Bilge pump. 150 amp battery charger, nice size battery charger, deep freezer refrigerator, fresh water flush electric heads. That's nice, but that tells me you're going to be using a lot of water flushing your heads. 
So you're probably going to want to add a water maker on this boat. Uh, 110 volt shore power, cockpit cushions, davits, life raft, tender, comes with a tender, swim ladder, outboard engine brackets with a 10 horsepower Nissan for the tender. So it comes with a tender and an outboard on the tender. Cockpit table, electric windlass, they said that already, cockpit shower. The important thing to have is a shower out at the cockpit. That way you can wash off stuff. Lazy jacks, lazy bags. Okay, so let's talk about the general description. You know, I normally read through this. I'm just kind of looking at some of the stuff that they say. And this is where they put all the all the marketing stuff. And, you know, this one also has a captain's quarter up in the bow compartment. Yeah, we saw that. This is the sales guy's kind of blurb about the boat and what he th thinks is important. Um, and so I like to give those a pretty quick inner, inner read. Uh, the galley, you know, I think the galley on this thing is fairly minimum. Without having an actual stove and oven built in with just a, uh, a, uh, a countertop toaster oven, I, I'm kind of disappointed in that, especially for a boat that has such large tankage. doesn't seem like they, they paid much attention to provide, and, and a large refrigerator and freezer. Uh, you have a large refrigerator and a large freezer and all that tankage, you would think they would put a decent stove in this thing. Uh, but they did not, and there's no place to put one. So your your countertop convection oven looks like what you're going to be stuck with on this boat. Um, so that's sort of odd, you know, because, you know, five and a half cubic foot isotherm refrigerator and a freezer, um, that's a lot of refrigeration and freezer. I am also disappointed, I, even though I like the isotherm refrigerators, they're front loading. Uh, one thing on boats, everything's about efficiency and, and power management. And so when you're on a sailboat, you really prefer having those kinds of, uh, of a refrigerator where you, where you have a, a, a compartment that opens up on the top where you can open a lid up and then reach down in the refrigerator. That, therefore, everything that all the cold air that's in there stays in there. It contains it. So you, it's very efficient. You don't have to refrigerate the whole space again. You're just reaching in, getting one thing out of it and keeping the cold contained. When you have a front-loading door and you open that door, all the cold air rushes out. It all spills out onto the floor because hot air rises, cold air sinks. You open the door, everything runs out. So when you close the door, that refrigerator then has to get engaged and has to cool that entire airspace down again. So it's not a very efficient system as compared to a top-loading type refrigerator. Just something to point out. Okay, reverse cycle AC, three units, nice, U-shaped tip T, yep, large lockers, eh, it's arguable. Navigation, got a 12-volt outlet, the navigational seat. Furuno, okay, here we talk about the nav quit. We have Furuno stuff, and Furuno tends to be fairly high quality. So, try data repeater at the nav station, so that's cool. Bruno AIS Class B, good to know. 14-inch touchscreen, all important stuff to look at. Raymarine Autopilot with wireless remote, very nice. Okay, Bruno speakers, interior speakers, cockpit speakers. Okay, so here we're talking more about some of the features. They, they highlighted this actually walk-on. I find this interesting. She has a reinforced bow sprit for extra strength and performance with a center space between the tramplings you can actually walk on. Now, most of the boats that I've seen that have an area between the trampolines, you can usually walk on. There's few of them that you can't. They use that as a channel or a track for the anchor chain. Uh, they'll, move, they'll set the anchor further forward out on the bow and uh, create a channel that goes from the anchor locker forward uh, up to uh, uh, the bow for, for that. And so that creates this sort of walk-on uh, deck here. They do talk about the highest in-class bridge deck. That's sort of nice to see that. It's a Selden two-spreader twin shrouded boom and dies aluminum. So Selden's good stuff like that. Standing rigging, four stay, four shrouds. Main still love cars, low friction sliders. Here they're talking about the, um, the main sail is mounted to what's known as luff cars. These are, um, uh, in essence, pretty heavy-duty looking matchbox cars kind of thing that run in a track uh, up and down the mast that, that control the uh, sail and connect the sail to the main, to the, uh, to the mast. So uh, good design. Lazy jacks. Yeah, we saw that topping lift. 
Roller Furler, Genoa Halyard, Stasel Halyard, Spinnaker Halyard, LED Navigation, Deck Mount LEDs, Main Street Lease to the Helm. All this is just your pretty typical stuff at, with, with any kind of a boat that has all your your lines read, led back to the helm station. They're just saying that everything is, is led back. Now, see here, this is where I was questioning before. Here it shows a Genoa and a Jenniker. That's why there was two head sails. And all the reefing lines are read, led back. So very good. So you don't have to go forward to raise the, the main or lower the main, which is a great design for that. Are we talking about the engines, raw water engine, cooled heat exchanger, electrical panel, dual controls, yada, yada, yada. Six kilowatt generator. So it's got a generator in addition to the two Yanmars. 125 gallon long range fuel tank with a filler plate in the cockpit, electric fuel gauges, fuel pre filter, shut off valve, two 12 volt, 130 amp engine alternators with battery chargers. House batteries bank, one port and one starboard engine battery. And you've got a three kilowatt inverter, mainstay Yamaha, six kilowatt general starboard engine room. What it's not showing is any other general 12 volt, well, let me, distribution panel and salon protected by label. Okay, what they're not talking about here is they don't talk about, um, thanks, Joe. They're not talking about uh, how big the battery bank is. Uh, no solar panels or anything like that. So, so now what's, uh, this is where I found some interesting stuff. It says vinyl ester and strong ISO resins with Nitacore core used in the holes above the waterline as well as throughout the boat hand layups. Nitacore. So what's Nitacore? I saw this and I'm like, okay, what is Nitacore? So I went and I looked up Nitacore. And what Nitacore is, is generally speaking, it's a honeycomb structurally designed panel that is integrated into the decks and, and the hull of the boat. Here you can see different views of it, different pictures of it, sort of a honeycomb material. What I like about a honeycomb core is that if you pierce this, you're going to fill up the cavity of one, two, or three, whatever the crack or break is in the honeycomb. But the moisture that gets into this is not running laterally along like it would in a laid up fiberglass or balsa or plywood, if you will. It's only going to be kept localized in one or two or three cells or whatever cells get exposed. And you're not going to have these big long runs of moisture going out throughout the hull. I particularly found this picture very interesting here where they were showing the layup of the fiberglass and sandwiched between the layup of the hull. You can see how nice and thick the fiberglass is uh, top and bottom and then that honeycomb section in the middle. And so when I started doing a bit more research about that, um, I, I was really pleased with how uh, well, that all laminated and secured together. The whole thing is being one solid panel with this integrated honeycomb panel on the inside. Now, for me, I kind of like the idea of that as a panel, as opposed to a foam panel or a balsa panel, which is typically what they would do um, to, to give it a little strength. Honeycomb is, an, is from an engineering standpoint, okay, Anybody who took a little engineering in high school or college will tell you that that honeycomb design is a really strong uh, design. It, it, it has a lot of, uh, of, of lateral uh, strength to it um, because of the structure of the honeycomb. One piled up against the other. They form a very strong grid, ridge work. And so I was really interested to see that these hulls of this boat were designed using this kind of material. I, I kind of like that. And when you're looking at boats and you start looking at this kind of stuff, you know, chase that kind of stuff down, you know, research that. And, and if you see something like, you know, uh, Nitacore, well, you know, what the heck is Nitacore? And so you go and you do your homework and you find out this Nitacore is this kind of structural stuff. And I'm going to go here to, I'm going to go to the page that this was from. Um, and, uh, Okay, guys, we'll talk later about that. Um, this was about a Pursuit 3070 center cockpit boat that was at 2000 Fort Lauderdale Boat Show. 
And yeah, yeah, yeah. So what does that have to do with this Knight of Course stuff? Well, so you get down here and here's where that picture was used. And you see a cross section of not note the completeness of lamination, even on those difficult to laminate corners. And so I really like that solid design. Um, now, this picture was obviously not used on this specific boat, but that's the same material that they're using in the same application. So that should uh, that should have the oh, there was that page I was looking at before. So that would have that same design, and so that tells us a lot about Nitacore and uh, and how it was made. So that's interesting stuff to know, and it's stuff that you should research when you're looking at boats. The materials used to build the boat is critical on how well that boat's going to hold up in the long term. Now, there's a lot of guys talk about some of what they what they call now blue water boats. And you look at some of the boats like the old cows, which is one of my old favorites. The entire boat is laid up with nothing but fiberglass, solid fiberglass. Um, they, they have a mold. They would go in and spray the mold with, uh, with some paint. And then they would lay up a fiberglass mat and roll it all out, chasing all the air bubbles out of it. Then they would put another mat. And then they put another mat. And, and every time they'd lay on the, the polyester resins which is like the, the liquid glue, the liquid plastics, and they would lay another mat and another mat. And these mats are, you know, they're woven fiberglass uh, material, and they would lay that up layer after layer after layer after layer after layer until they had a big thick hole laid up. Some of the old cows up in the bows, they might have inch and a half solid thick fiberglass. I can tell you firsthand, you could run into a dock at a pretty good speed and not damage that hole. Um, compared to some of the more modern boats where they've got, you know, wee little tiny fiberglass uh, uh, layups. And then they put in a inch of core material, uh, which if properly laminated, get, again, that honeycomb could give it some strength and still be fairly lightweight. The old boats like my old cows, they were very heavy boats, very, very heavy boats. Um, so these new materials are being used to try to keep boats lighter. More so in the catamaran genre than the monohull. Not as big a deal in the monohull because monohulls need the weight to maintain their, 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 their right side up. Okay, They need to have all the weight down in the hull, uh, down in the keel. They, they usually will add lead ballast to them to, to give it weight down low so that the top of the boat stays up in the air and, and can offset a pendulum effect that you have with the wind pushing on the sails. You need to have that counterbalanced weight. Catamarans, they don't do that. They, they're much lighter. And so the lighter they can make them, the faster they can be, the more fuel efficient they can be. So anyhow, so I read down through here and I redress the material. And, you know, it's all the usual stuff talking about it. Electric windlass, delta primary anchor, fortress backup, 200 foot chain. Always like to see a lot of chain on the anchor. Um... Avon 310, Nissan 10, yep, 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 yep. Life raft included. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, so let's go back up, and we're looking at this Alpha 42. Let me go back to where the picture is. There you go. There's the Alpha 42. Yeah, it's a pretty nice little boat. You know, fairly well designed, has all the latest Furuno gear, all the latest technology. Uh, cabins look like they could be comfortable. Uh, 42 foot catamaran, $410,000. You know, to me, some of the main selling features are the fact that it's got sugar scoops. It's got a nice seating area inside. The galley, I'm a little disappointed in for 410, but all in all, not a bad, not a bad choice and not a bad option. So then the question becomes, okay, well, who the hell is Alpha Boat? So I go ahead and I do a search for Alpha. And all I can find about Alpha is a Facebook page. Um, they used to have a website. In fact, the Facebook page has a link to a website. Well, let me follow that, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So you go on here, and okay, you're looking up Alpha, and it says here, here's their face, here's their website. You go to the website, and obviously their website is no more. This is one of those things where somebody else bought their website and is trying to uh, use it for a bunch of other nonsense. So it does; it no longer exists. And uh, so that was a big red flag to me. I'm like, well, what happened to Alpha Yachts? So I get on and I start looking at some other articles. This is an article from Windcheck. Uh, they talk about how good the Alphas are built on Long Island and 
latest technology and all the latest gear and good quality this and good quality that and you know boat of the year kind of contention and some pictures and some designs you know this if you ask me this is a much better picture of the head where you can actually see the the head in there and showing some of the optional joystick controls inside and anyhow so they're they're just showing some other options of the boat and some different pictures and perspectives of it there was also an article in uh, Cruising World magazine. Um, there was a, another article supposedly in Cruising Outpost magazine, my buddy Bob's magazine, but I couldn't find his particular one. But here they talk about the quality of the boat, and they're saying here, 42-footer, average base price, three ninety-five. dollars But they had eight orders already on the ledger. They have a lot of people trying to buy these, had like 10 of them on sale, I heard. Another person say they had like 10 of them, up, you know, being made. People wanting to buy the things and uh, they look like they're pretty nice catamarans. I love the fact that they were made in New York on Long Island. <clears throat> um, I like the fact that they're using this Nitacore honeycomb and the bulkheads. It was just a lot of things to like about them. But... I made a call to the company and I got an answer machine and the fact that there's no website tells me that Alpha Yachts is probably no more. I'm not saying that they are no more. I'm just saying that they're probably no more. I would find it suspect that a boat manufacturer wouldn't have a website anymore. So, uh, you know, you have to look at these things when you're shopping a boat because now you're looking at, okay, if you buy... If you buy this boat, if you buy this very beautiful Alpha 42, 2014, recent manufacturer, $410,000 catamaran, uh, and, and it is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful boat, do you really want to buy a catamaran from a company that's no longer in existence? There's no support then for that product. What does that mean? Well, you know, really, in the overall scheme of things, that doesn't mean a damn thing because anything that's going to go wrong with that boat is going to be a component, and all the component manufacturers are still there. You know, North Sales is still North Sales, and and uh, you know, uh, Furuno is still Furuno, and and all, you know, whoever manufactured any of the components being used on the boat. The hardware, if you will, the electronics, those guys are still in existence. They're still, still doing business. Specific design parameters, support for hull delaminations, those sorts of things. Um, it's not going to be there from that company. Now, that's a big issue. And yet, from my own experience, I can tell you that that is very common in the industry even for some of the manufacturers like Lagoon Catamaran, who's probably the big boy on the block, uh, and Leopard, who's another big boy on the block, provides most of the boats for the uh, charter companies. Uh, they historically uh, have very, very poor customer service. Uh, a lot of the French Catamaran boats, I, I'm sure they're going to hate hearing that, but it has been my experience and the amount of, of accounts that I've read of numerous people that have owned the boats is that uh, getting service work done by them is, uh, is very difficult to have done that their customer service is not great. So, so that's a question that, you know, you're going to have to ask for yourself. Overall, I think this boat is uh, a nice little catamaran alpha 42. Uh, the fact that this company is no longer in business would be a concern for buying such a new boat. Uh, they've only had a couple models out, which is also a concern. So I would uh, I would have some concerns with that, but you know at four hundred and ten thousand dollars, there's a certain number of things on this boat I really like. I like the idea that I can walk completely from side to side across the back of the boat. Looks like some nice sugar scoops, although not very large at the bottom, not a big area down here, um, but still not a bad boat for the money. But the reason I did this video was not just to show you that particular boat. But to help you in thinking a little bit about what the process is that you need to go through when you're boat shopping, things that you should be keeping an eye out uh, and thinking about, you know, research the materials that they use and then use common sense. You know, um, I like seeing companies that are using some of the more uh, modern techniques of uh, vacuum sealing and, and sealing up the holes and stuff and getting the air out of them. 
Um, on boats, you know, you, you have delamination is an issue. You have blisters. It's an issue in some boats. And that all can be avoided by using the right materials and the right techniques for laying it up. So fortunately, most of the manufacturers are going to much better techniques. And those holes are lasting a whole lot longer um, and holding up better. But it's still something to be an issue. So anyhow, this video is getting very long. So I'm going to end it here. Just something for you guys to think about. If you like this kind of thing, please do like and subscribe. Uh, check out my Patreon page if you want to become an insider here for Grandpa's Farm Goes Sailing. And we will have more sailing-related content for you here in the near future. In the meantime, from my crappy little garage here in Lancaster, Ohio, I'm having a ball here bringing you guys some more videos. So we'll talk to you later, kids. Be good, be careful, and take good care of each other, okay? Thanks. Bye.